Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at this incredible festival. I hope you've been able to witness lots of brilliance, make the networks and connections you desired, and we appreciate you joining us for this panel. Uh, my name is Lola Adedokin. I'm the executive director of the Aspen Global Innovators Group. I'm also the co-chair of the Aspen Forum on Women and Girls, and a I have to say, fangirl of every single person on this panel, so it's truly a privilege. <laughs> um, I think we are going to have a really exciting conversation today. This is about the future, um, and we have a set of panelists who are bringing incredible expertise from so many sectors, so they are the most informed people, I think, to help us figure out how to design health systems for a future that is better for our generation and the next. So before I launch into the Q&A, the conversation we're going to have here, I just want to sort of set a little bit of grounding. Um, obviously, we are still emerging, adjusting to an incredibly traumatic pandemic global event. We saw everywhere, no matter what a country's GDP was, systems fail. And yet, we saw brilliance emerge, unusual suspect leaders show up for their neighbors, unpaid, not supported in any way other than the desire to help the neighbor next to them to ensure that they all made it through. It also showed us the real flaws in our systems um, and gave us an opportunity to sort of reflect on that. But I have to pause and say how quickly we forget the Ebola outbreak, not that long ago. In that moment, we had researchers put out copious amounts of reflections and lessons learned. And what did we do with it? Not much, um, sadly, especially in high-resource settings where we could have done a lot. And yet we saw in quote-unquote low-resource settings, innovation still happen. Um, we saw new ideas come to the fore. We saw resources shift to what I'm thrilled to see, local leadership. We now know that that is where the answers lie, that when we think about replication and scale and growth, it's not about the decision makers who may be sitting here in Aspen, may be sitting in Geneva. It's truly about the wisdom and expertise of those closest to the systems and the ex experience. Um, so with that said, I wanted to just read a definition. Out of both of those, this recent pandemic and the Ebola crisis, there was a group of researchers and partners who defined what health system resilience was. I don't know if any of you saw this, but I like the definition. But after that, we were like, what do we do? So health system resilience is the ability of health systems not only to prepare for shocks, but also to minimize the negative consequences of such disruptions recover as quickly as possible, and adapt by learning lessons from the experience to become better performing and more prepared. That is it. We have the answer. Conversation complete. <laughs> um, no, it's so much harder. So I have this incredible panel. They bring, like I said, expertise, um, Peggy, leadership in, from the Aspen Institute for many years, leadership at the Ford Foundation, Save the Children, among other institutions. You're now the CEO of the Institute for the Center for Research on Women. I have Sheila Davis here, who's brilliant. I want to start with, and she reminds me, and I love it. I love when nurses do this. She is a nurse first. <laughs> if you ever meet a nurse, that's where they lead, and I love it. Yay. <laughs> um, but she's led Partners in Health. She's the CEO of Partners in Health and was there to lead um, the organization and in the communities they serve through the Ebola response. She has experience during the HIV AIDS epidemic as an activist and leader. And Didi Bertrand Farmer, who is an advisor on adolescent youth health, gender and development, and Partners in Health uh, ambassador. She's a medical anthropologist and community health specialist with expertise and experience in Haiti, Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, France, and the Bahamas. Wow, what expertise. <laughs> but what is really special about Didi is she brings a passionate commitment to women and girls, but especially adolescent girls. These are the women who are delivering the future, and yet in research and science and systems, they are overlooked. And so we appreciate your championship so let's get into the panel conversation. 
I'd like to start with, we have the bios, um, but I'd like to go through and just tell me a little bit about what brings you to this work, to this space, this conversation. And I'd love to start with you, Peggy. Hey, thanks, thanks, Lola. Um, what brings me to this work is you, Lola, <laughs> Sheila, Phoebe, all of you in this room. Um, I am incredibly moved by all of the New Voices Fellows here, by Phoebe's kids, by John, by Carol, by everyone who's showing up here to think about how we can build a better world that starts with health. And, you know, just in terms of my own heart and soul, Lola, I think I fundamentally believe in the right to health. It's yeah. enshrined in the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, health is not a side issue. It's fundamental to the well-being and the nurturing of every, every society everywhere in the world. And so what I keeps me going and what brings me here is being able to sit and listen to Sheila and, D and Didi and you and to watch you lift up the leaders of the future and to help us to think about how we can together solve these problems. So um, I can't walk away from some of the things that we're seeing today and I feel that with all of us together we can address it. Thank you. How about you, Didi? Well, um, maybe I would like to, to start by saying how um, happy I am mm -hmm. to be here with all of us, all of you to, to, today, to experience um, this beautiful, you know, those beautiful two days. It's my first time in Aspen, and I really, really enjoy it. And thank you, Lola, for inviting me. And um, I'm very, very thrilled to be able to share um, this panel with three wonderful women that, who I admired. Mm -hmm. And um, Peggy and, and Sheila, it's very special for me to be sitting here with you today. Now to the question, um, you know, It's, it's a, a, a little bit um, emotional for me because how, the, how could I have not been part of this work, mm. you know, when the connection mm -hmm. can be found far away from my upbringing before I even met Paul Farmer and married him. This work started the day he showed up in my hometown in nearby Haiti, 37 years ago, hmm. for it to become what PIH, you know, is today, a global movement hmm. trying to change the world for the most vulnerable ones. Most importantly, after his, um, you know, devastated loss, the question is how I can still be waking up every single day and do this work alongside, you know, my colleagues, my friends, all of you in this global community. Because this legacy that he left us behind is my legacy. It's our legacy, you know, to pursue. So this is what really brings me in this work. And I continue to commit to health system strengthening, to community health worker programming, adolescent and gender, as you said, through um, multiple institutions that I represent here today. Mm -hmm including um, the, the Women and Girls Initiative that I created myself to really focusing on adolescent girls, Partners in Health, and also the Global Institute at the University of Miami. Mm -hmm. So this is what, you know, we are here together. It's our legacy to stand up, to keep um, the fight for the most vulnerable ones. And I think Paul, where he is, is proud of us. Yes. Thank yes. you. 
You know, if Paul were here with, with us, he would say, listen to those three women. They have all the answers. <laughs> and he would be cheering us on. And Thanks. I want to thank you. Um, we all stand on the shoulders of giants, next to the shoulders of giants, and we appreciate so much you bringing the legacy. Um, I hope we leave with that. How do we pass on that legacy and truly make it global? So thank you for your leadership, bravery, and courage. How about you, Sheila? So, um, so, so happy to be here and really um, honored to be on this panel with these amazing women. And also um, just want to say that, that with the loss of Paul, there's been a few gifts, one being that I've got to work much more closely with Dee Dee and recognize her brilliance. And I think sometimes mm -hmm. always being the, the one so behind. Oh, thank you being the one behind the scenes, um, it's, it's clear that Didi's expertise is making PIH much stronger, so mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I think being a nurse, and, and I had to put that in, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, you know, we bear witness to so much from the, the beauty of life, but also people are the most vulnerable of life and death, and I think the, um, you know, through my work at Partners in Health, we've been able to make amazing changes around the world from starting a university to building a teaching hospital in Haiti and, and see the, um, the brilliance of bringing people together and that movement. And it's clear that everybody has a really important role, whether you're a, a nurse or, or you're a teacher or you're a business person, and it really is all of our moral responsibility. And I truly do believe that it's, we don't have the, um, the right to look away. And I think that this meetings like this are so powerful because you can you can see and hear from and are so much stronger together and and hearing the fellows and and just getting so inspired by what they're doing and their energy gives me hope for the future thank you here we go and we're done <laughs> <laughs> no this is again you can see why we have this incredible panel of, of experts so let's talk about Brass tacks, the real work. How do we make this happen? And I'll go back to Peggy again. You're now the CEO of the Institute or the Center for Research on Women. And um, again, you bring so much other, so many other lenses to your work. But you also think about innovation. Um, you also were the previous ED of the Global Innovators Group. Um, and so I would love to hear from you about sort of where innovation sits in your mind, how that manifests in leadership for you? Great. No, thank you for that question. Um, sometimes people think innovation really just means technology. Um, and if we learned anything from COVID, that didn't get us anywhere. The whole nations were shut down because we didn't have the ability to reach every person to be tested or to be vaccinated. Um, so it's interesting, when I was leading Aspen Global Innovators Group and was fortunate enough to find Lola to pass the baton to, um, we really spend a lot of time, and I hope you all have felt it in the last few days, finding incredible young leaders and emerging leaders who have pioneered and invented innovation that's deeply people-centered and deeply community-based. And so I spent a lot of my time looking for those solutions and the idea being bring those solutions to the global stage and connect them to systems. And now running International Center for Research on Women, I have some other things in my toolbox. Um, uh, data and evidence and research is fundamentally important to bring the brilliant idea of some of the New Voices fellows who are in this room and others to scale and to global policymakers and to practice on a larger scale that's needed. And um, so I don't think we can move beyond an individual innovative leader to the scale where we're influencing governments and the global stage without data and evidence to bear. And so let me just give you an example. Um, there was a remarkable New Voices fellow named Dixon Chibanda. He happened to be the only psychiatrist in the country of Zimbabwe. Those of you that know global health wouldn't think that's unusual. And, but huge mental health crisis across the country. How could we ever deal with it? And then he thought, who are the people 
who are trusted in this culture. And he said, the grandmothers, the grandmothers are trusted in this culture. So he said, what if I could figure out some kind of a training for the grandmothers who could do initial triage work with people around mental health issues? And so he came up with this beautiful idea called the friendship bench. And it's literally a bench. And they train grandmothers to sit on the bench. Mm -hmm. And so this is this wildly innovative idea that immediately broke down the mm -hmm. barriers for people who didn't have financial resources or the trust to go into the mental health system. And so Dixon was this one brilliant guy with a crazy idea. And we brought him here to Aspen Ideas mm -hmm. Health maybe 10 years ago or something. And he got the attention of um, Prince Harry and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, AARP and all of these things. And his model is being replicated all around the world. But there was a moment where we needed to prove that this was a, this was a valid way to approach a community-based, people-centered way to deal with mental health. So I love to think now about the linkages between innovative ideas and moving them to scale, and how do we do that? And COVID cracked that open. I mean, all of us have been talking about public health and community-based health for so long. I was like, oh, that's nice, you know, it's over there. But no, it shut down whole countries, whole nations, whole economies. And so health and ill health of a person anywhere is ill health of a person everywhere. Mm -hmm. And the only way to get to solutions is to be closely proximate to the ground and to really think about the cultural complexities and the community realities within which our health systems take place. So that's part of what I'm thinking mm -hmm. about now. Um, and I have a lot of faith and hope in, in that. And uh, the trick for an organization like mine is to partner with UGHG, with Partners in Health and others, to continually iterate and ask questions that are impossible to answer. Why don't we have good health systems? What, let's try community health workers. Mm -hmm. Let's try uh, you know, this, this notion of continual learning in order to make health care available to everyone. Spot on. And, and you, you named something for me that I think is worth noting. I'm going to get a little off book. But what you are acknowledging in the example of Dixon is this knowledge transfer from the global south to the global north, which phrasing, it is what it is. But there's so much to, to be learned from the rest of the world. And to, to Sheila, and both to you as Peggy as well, how do we set up that shift in knowledge transfer so that we here can humble ourselves to accept the wisdom and innovation and expertise from outside of our environs. You know, I think this became really apparent when COVID first came and, and Partners in Health was asked to head up um, uh, the contact <clears throat> tracing program in Massachusetts. And I think some people were, why are you going to a global health NGO to help do this? Because, but I think it was clear that what was missing was the ability to connect with people and gain their trust and connect them into testing and then vaccination. And so we were able to take lessons learned from HIV, MDRTB, from Peru, from Haiti, and from Ebola in Sierra Leone or Liberia and say, really it is those trusted messengers or those accompanitors, which we call them community health workers, that were able to make the difference. So we infused those aspects, a lot of it which is addressing people as a whole person, and that's addressing their social needs of food and transportation. And we built that into the Massachusetts contact tracing program to say, you can't just tell somebody to quarantine. You have to then say, do you have the ability to have diapers? Do you have formula? Um, you know, do you need to be put in a hotel so that your family is safe? Mm -hmm. and, and was so proud that that key aspect of, of the special sauce of Partners in Health was integrated into the Massachusetts program, and then we were asked to bring it to other places in the U.S. And there, were, there was pushback yeah. because people would say, "We don't, we don't need what happens in Haiti, mm -hmm. in California, or whatever." And it's clear we do. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was we were able to bring experts from Haiti, from Malawi, from Rwanda to these global dialogues in, in also within the U.S to say, let's break down what is actually needed, what are those functional things, and who best has the experience to do that. And it was from people in, not in the US. But I think we have a long way to go yeah. in this. But I think insisting on the bi-directionality and really pushing our academic institutions, pushing NGOs, pushing whoever we work with, the private sector, to say, actually, we need to look at how we're benefiting in this 
and raising the voices of those who have the true expertise. Mm -hmm. And we need both. We need both to come to the table. But it, it's going to take all of us to push for that to happen because you, you, can't, you can't share your wisdom if you're not at the table. Right. So I think that's up to us to bring people to the table and then get out of the way. Yeah. And connected to that, um, in the spirit of never forget, which we hear after every major terrible crisis, um, we have to build a bench of leaders who are ready to then take the charge. And I'm looking to you, Didi, to talk a little bit about how you support adolescent girls to be empowered, to feel engaged as leaders in systems building and community building. It's a, it's a great question <laughs> because um, it's, it's, it's long-term investment. Mm -hmm. um, let me just state some facts here, please. Did you know that we have 800, over 880 million adolescent girls aged 15 to 25, which account for 12% of the world population. The majority of them live in the middle, low and middle income countries. Among this number, there are 129 million that are not in school, not in training. 21 million girls get pregnant and another, another 12 million give birth every single day. So this is the image that we are, talk, we are starting from. Because to have people, to have young girls to be sitting in this room to discuss, they have to have education. They have to have had access to education. And we know that as soon as a girl is pregnant, it's over right. um, for her. And the cycle of intergenerational poverty and exclusion will continue. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing to address this problem? Yes. Because we have to prepare the next generation of girls to be able to have the education and the knowledge that they need to contribute mm -hmm. huh, to society. Mm -hmm. So this is where we, you know, get involved. Mm -hmm. At WGI and um, Partners in Health and the Institute now in the Bahamas and in, in, um, in Miami, it's what we do. We provide a comprehensive package mm -hmm. huh, that that's offers social protection and empowerment to these girls, mm -hmm. to those marginalized girls that no one sees. Mm -hmm. We offer them with access to education, training, health, economic opportunities. It's not one thing, mm -hmm. it's all together. Yeah. Can I add so, one thing? Oh, sorry, of course. No, 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 I would like just to, to um, illustrate here um, about two girls who joined our programs, um, one in the aftermath of, of the 2010 earthquake, she was 10, another one who joined the program in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew in 2017, she was 10. So today, these young women, they are how old? 23? Mm -hmm and 16. But these young women, with our support, they managed to complete secondary school. They went to university. But they went to university how? Free of pregnancy, mm -hmm. free of HIV. Mm -hmm. huh? They have received huh, the support that they need to cope with violence, huh? to cope with all the adversities that you know the Haiti is going through yeah. right now. So the challenges that girls and young women are facing, they expand to abject poverty, violence, high HIV rates, as you know, maternal mortality, huh? migration, internal displacement, mm -hmm. unemployment, those are the things we need yes. to think about. Yes. 
So if we want to prepare the next generation of, of, uh, of girls, this is where we need to open space for intergenerational um, exposure where we give them space uh, to create because they come up, I'm telling you, this is why people always said, oh, how come you, you, you are so young? I said, this is one of the, yeah. of the return <laughs> when you're working with young people. <laughs> so they bring a lot of energy, they bring a lot of passion, mm -hmm. they can innovate when they have the space, the opportunity, mm -hmm. and the support mm -hmm. to create. So if we need to create a health system that will serve young people in the long run, they need to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. with the support, with our mentorship, mm -hmm. with our coaching, uh, to strengthen their leadership, yeah. to um, bring new knowledge to them, because they ask, they only ask for that. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think that building on that, at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, the, of the medical school, two-thirds, policy-wise, two-thirds who admit it are women. And the, the, that's a deliberate decision that was made when this university opened to say, we have a long way to go to really change the, den the gender dynamic in Rwanda and, and uh, the continent overall. And I think that was that is a concrete thing that, was, that we live into, and an important piece of really ensuring that this next generation from this university in Rwanda are gonna be able to make these changes and be the best role models for these women, young girls to see, and that's, I think, an important piece also that we need to build in. And then maybe one last aspect that I can bring, because it's what we are saying in our work with the University of Miami, um, a lot of young women right now are set away. You know, they are taking the journey uh, to migrate. When, and then when they ended up in Miami or in Texas or in the Bahamas without papers, so we, we, we see the same cycle of issues mm -hmm. because they cannot access education, mm -hmm. they cannot access health services. So for us, what we are trying to do is to advocate, you know, through the, our partners in these countries mm -hmm. to expand services mm -hmm. to them, but it's not easy. Yeah. You know, it's not easy because it's additional needs that, is, that they need, you know, and it's only means in terms of resources because there is a cost mm -hmm. associated with it. And there is a lot of advocacy that needs to be done mm -hmm. for these people, uh, for their rights as human beings, you know, to be considered. Yeah. We can't go much farther without recognizing that tomorrow is one year since Roe v. Wade was overturned. Yes. And um, it is clear that if you're talking about health systems that are working for the most vulnerable, adolescent girls are at yes. the very heart of that. But it's also so clear to all of us sitting here and to all of you that young women in particular are the pawns, political pawns, yeah. in somebody else's political agenda. And the issue of reproductive rights and access to health for women and girls is we see it in Iran, we see it in Afghanistan, we see mm -hmm. it in we see it everywhere around the world. And if you're talking about the health systems of the future, if they are founded on equity, if young women and girls are not at the center, not at the center, we are really, really, really missing mm -hmm. potential of all of those young girls that you just described. Thank you all. That's such an exciting time. Um, globally um, and also quite scary um, for all of us but I, I think you, you noted political will um, in your remarks Peggy and and on top of that you know we can't do very much without financial resources and a new way of financing systems I mean you've all alluded to the fact that it's not just the health system it's all of these other sectors and systems that result in better health and well-being do you have any wisdom or guidance to provide for funders, investors, governments who are paying for services? How should they better invest? How can they make their dollar go further? Um, and how can they ensure that they are working towards a goal that is aligned? Yeah. It's a, um, it's a hard, I think one thing that I would just say is one of the things we saw in COVID is 
how incredibly broken the U.S. healthcare system is, I mean, compared to other parts in the world. The other thing it's important to note is the countries that were led by women were some of the best performers mm. during COVID, and I think it's a very simple message. It's a people-centered approach, and it's a human approach, and not in a marketing kind of a sense, but in a profound way. Um, but, you know, you asked the question of how do, you, how do we connect to governments and how does our work connect? And so I want to pick up on your point, Dee Dee, of the education, the role of education, the role of health, and this integrated approach mm -hmm. to health systems. Um, so just in terms of women in our own work at International Center for Research on Women, we've made a lot of progress in girls' education, a lot of other areas. Do you want to know one area where we are going backwards, seriously? Violence against women. Mm. It's pervasive all around the world. It's off the charts in every country of the world after COVID. And so we have this particular way we approach mm. training and looking at violence. Because we say there's prevention, there's treatment, and there's justice. And so at International Center for Research on Women, with some of the non-partner, nonprofit partners in India, we realize that some of the health issues are about behaviors and cultural beliefs, certainly the way young girls are treated. And so this one program started to work in the schools with young boys mm -hmm. around attitudes. And is it okay to hit a girl? Is it okay? And so some of these profound inequities in the health system need to be tackled in the way you're doing with mm -hmm. adolescent girls, in, in the way our colleagues in India are doing it with two million kids in the schools, really young kids around what are your beliefs, around what is, what is healthy and what is appropriate and gender norms. So that is an ex interesting example yeah. because two states in India said, well, we have to do this. So they trained 25,000 teachers, two million kids have been through this, and the longitudinal studies are showing there's a decrease in violence against women. Wow. So some of these issues are gonna take some generations right. for us to solve. But that can get the attention of, of the policymakers and it can become part of policy which can make a difference. Yeah, I think there's, you know, there's a cost of inaction, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think sometimes we focus on what it costs, but if we really look at, at what happens when we don't invest in, in young women, what, what the overall um, outcome is, but I think if, if I could have a magic wand, mm -hmm. which I wish I could, um, I think if, if we look, if we could change the dynamic of, of how we fund our, our emergency things in the world. If there's an emergency, people rally, money appears. Mm. So billions of dollars, you know, during COVID. Uh, uh, so whenever there's a natural disaster. And if, if a portion of that was allocated, not during the disaster, but before the disaster, mm. before the next mm. one, to build strong health systems, those communities would be so much more resilient than if not. Mm. So I, I, when people say there's not enough money, I, I think there's enough money. I just don't think it's allocated the right way. Mm -hmm. And I think with our COVID money, we used it to build um, oxygen systems throughout all the countries in which we work. Those oxygen, oxygen systems weren't just benefiting COVID patients. They're benefiting all our patients, women who are getting C-sections, you know, children who are, who are having challenges. So I, I think if we can challenge policymakers mm -hmm. to to look at how they're allocating money and pushing money out and making decisions about how that money is used, those decisions made on those in the most proximity to where the suffering is happening, we would be light years ahead. Mm -hmm. If I can build on that also, I think that there are ways to eliminate waste mm -hmm. because um, there is a lot of duplication. Yeah. You know, some, oh, many organizations are, are and we, we, we saw that in, um, when I say we, PIH, we saw that in Haiti in the aftermath of Hurricane Matthew or after the 2010 earthquake. So many organizations, they want to work on, in the same area and serving the same population mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what is going on there. Duplication. Yes. You know, some people are going home with the money mm -hmm. and then some others are investing in. So how to find ways to build, you know, true collaboration, hmm, true partnership mm -hmm. towards a goal within you know, a network of organizations. And yesterday in the discussion, people, people were talking about how difficult it can be, but it can happen too. Mm -hmm. You know, if we put our minds together, yeah. if the, the, the goal 
you know, it, it is shared. Yeah. We can use the dollars that we have in a more efficient yeah. way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so eliminating, elim eliminating waste, coalition, networking, that can be a way also to serve um, the population that we yeah. choose. Mm -hmm. In my case, you know, adolescent girls. Mm -hmm. And we will, we will even have better data mm -hmm. hmm? to share and measure and along the way where, see exactly where we had made progress and how to continue moving forward. So one last question before we turn to the audience for, for questions. Um, we can't leave here without a, an explicit direction. So before we leave this room today, mm -hmm. each of you, what's the first next thing that we can do when we leave Aspen, go back to our daily lives to contribute to strengthening health systems? Mm -hmm. Big one, <laughs> just one thing. <laughs> I think we need to pay attention. And I think that it's looking at the, the root cause of where a lot of these challenges come from. And if, to my view, policies are a big piece of this and shifting the way that, that money is given to improve global health. Even if people learned about that, hmm. the, the Paul Farmer Memorial Resolution was, was um, launched in Congress to look at changing the way that that um, money is, uh, is given from the, the US and even learning about that and, and being bold and, learn, and being willing to reach out to your congressmen and, and paying attention to your own backyards as well as mm -hmm. where they're suffering and, and not turning away. Me, I would say um, if we are all here, this is such a really incredible gathering, it's because we are all care. You know, we care about the work, we care about the, the marginalized. So we need to take our activism to a higher level mm -hmm. and find the means because without money, there is nothing we can do. And us, we can do our, our share mm -hmm. also in making sure that we advocate for better policies, for better laws and um, regulations, and ensuring that they are enacted. And if we provide the dollars for them to be implemented, there we will hold our countries accountable. Because without accountability, there won't be sustainability. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with, with Sheila and Didi, and I think yeah, scale up your activism, it really matters. Advocacy really, really matters. And every little bit of activism. But I also think in our own, this is one of the things we learned from COVID so much. I think wherever you live, when you go back, maybe you know, if you're just driving around, think about things like, where, are th where is the healthy food available? And where is that hospital located? And is there activism? What is happening to the Planned Parenthood clinic that got shut down? What, mm -hmm. what do you just take a different lens from the last few days to where you walk and where you do your grocery shopping and who you interact with and think about if there's one piece of activism or resource or support that you could do when you get back next mm -hmm. week by Wednesday, my assignment is by <laughs> one thing. And that will make a huge difference, a huge difference in people's lives. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'd love to hear from our experts in the audience, curious learners. Any questions you have for our incredible panel? so much. My name is Kate Midden. I'm from the McKinsey Health Institute. And this is drawing on some comments that Peggy made, but I would love uh, reflections from all of you. But I wonder if you could extrapolate on that linkage between innovative strategies and scale. Mm -hmm. And also, um, if you're going to talk about measurement or showing the value, especially in a donor landscape, how you have overlapped that with thinking about things like fairness and equity. Um, I think the one thing I would say is um, 
you know, I've been fortunate enough to sit on boards and be um, supporters of some of the leading activists, who, for example, Last Mile Health, and Partners in Health is an example of this. The whole idea of community health workers was just kind of this sweet little idea. And there was a set of activities that really moved policy, scale, resources to bear that have made a huge difference in the numbers of community health workers all over the world. And so kind of the currency, I hate to say it, but it's a little bit fickle. I mean, it's like if you have somebody like a Paul or like a Didi or like a Raj Punjabi or like a Dixon Chubanda with a brilliant idea and you can somehow spread that idea, um, that's, I think, the linkage between, between innovation and scale. But in order to get the dollars that really make a difference, we really need to make an economic argument. There's no question that we can't be working in the space without really bringing evidence to bear that proves that you will save money by saving lives at community level or you will save money by having the right to reproductive health services in place. So I don't know if that quite answers your question, but I think it, it sounds like you're a philanthropist or a health system, and I think it's incumbent upon um, philanthropists to, to ask that question in health systems of how can we scale up some of the best efforts in the world. And you know, I was meeting with Sheila last night. Partners of Health is one of the largest health community health based equity health systems in the world. And I think that Sheila, even though she's managing 19,000 people, I don't know why she looks so comfortable <laughs> over there, but she would be the first to say, if she told me her budget's 300 million, it probably needs to be 3 billion. Yeah. Three billion dollars right. dedicated to people who don't have access to health care. Mm -hmm. Why not that? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about scale in a whole different level that is really about equity. You would have to have other CEOs mm -hmm. to help you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if others want to jump in on that question of scale. If I could chime in, uh, as a recovering philanthropist myself, <laughs> um, I do want to unpack the, the question of scale and the connection to community leadership. And let's not, not everything needs to be scaled everywhere in the same way. So I think there's nuance in the thinking of what's re replicable, what needs to be scaled and why, and then what needs to inform what that scale looks like. Um, and that just takes a little bit of one, I think you alluded to this too, Peggy, patience. This takes time, and you have to build in the space for learning. Some people call it failure, but we do that when we do innovation in every other sector. There is space for that. And so I think if we think about investing, we have to think about building in that space and time for mistakes to happen, for lessons to be captured, and the time to learn from those lessons. I, I also think the danger of the scale argument is it often is looking at one or two aspects. Mm -hmm. And so it, it gets reduced and, and it isn't really a, a accurate representation of what it takes to care for somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think if we think about us all going to our provider, we don't, we don't go for one in single intervention. But so much of global health is paying for one single intervention. Mm -hmm. yeah. That isn't how any of us have mm -hmm. care. So I feel like I, I want to always challenge the scale argument and say, yeah. I'll scale all, all you want, but we need the money to do yeah. it, and we're not going to reduce it to yeah. a single intervention mm -hmm. because that is, that's immoral because mm -hmm. it's not really addressing what is needed. So I, I really hope we can challenge that and, not, um, and, and challenge the, our donors to, to invest in comprehensive programs. Uh, hi, my name is Zoya. I'm a reporter for a magazine called Grist. It's a climate change magazine. And I'm writing a story right now about the rise of the climate doctor, and there's a lot of efforts mm -hmm. in the U.S. here to, um, to like, codify and institutionalize that, uh, medical professionals who care about climate mm -hmm. change and incorporate it into their work. And there's also a lot of folks overseas um, who have been thinking about this for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my question is really about how you like bring down those silos like you know in, in the west there's a lot that could be learned from people in developing nations who have long been thinking about climate change long been affected by climate change mm -hmm. and their health has long been affected by it um you said you know uh sheila bring you know these folks to the table and then get out of the way how do you is there a model for doing that mm -hmm. i mean i have not found that these doctors at harvard and yale and other institutions mm -hmm. that are thinking about climate change more carefully have been, you know, tapping 
doctors in like American Samoa um, for their expertise. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I don't see a model for that that appears to be effective at the moment. So any thoughts That's that you great. might have? It doesn't have to be climate specific. I'm just, I'm just wondering about the, the model there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, I don't think there's one answer of a, a system way to do it. I think it's you writing a story that's highlighting a, um, a somebody who's a change agent and has an idea, you getting other reporters to do the same thing. Because I think people want to see examples of this expertise or innovative thinking. And then finding champions, maybe it's at through Partners in Health, through the University of Global Health Equity, maybe it's at U Miami or whatever, that can, um, uh, believe in this and, and can convene people to have these conversations, but it's not going to be easy because we lack a lot of humility mm -hmm. in, in, in what can be done. So I, I think it's a long game of really finding those, though I don't know about the person in, in Samoa like I would love to, or mm -hmm. through Aspen and these global innovators. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from from some of hearing what the story core thing yesterday, I was like, great ideas. Mm -hmm. Like it may be that there's a few things that, that Aspen and others mm -hmm. can move forward around mm -hmm. highlighting people like this, but then it's gonna take, I think a much larger platform that is gonna have to take a lot of the media mm -hmm. being participating and being part of this. Mm -hmm. you guys yeah. I, I would just follow up to say, um, we're really happy to give you a list of some really <laughs> interesting people who are working on that intersection yeah. of climate and health. And it's a really profound issue, particularly heat, rising heat waves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for example, we were in, just in Miami, and there's a, there's a heat person responsible yeah. for the city of Miami. And the way it's kind of playing out in terms of community-based innovation is um, cooling. Because in Delhi, you know, it's 140 degrees. I mean, if this is the, the question of how then you can use solar technologies to... Um, Cooling is the first place that those kinds of innovations are happening. But, they, but I really agree with what Sheila said. If you can find some great, interesting stories and start spreading those, and also this, you know, we're in a moment of resilience. Yeah. Like, we have to find solutions. People will not survive unless we find solutions. And, and we have to look all over the world for those solutions. And so we're, I think Lola and the team can follow up and give you some lists of some really mm -hmm. cool people. They're doing some cool yeah. work. And it's not just overseas. It's also in, um, in communities that have been suffering from high rates of pollution for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's a number of things. But there's not enough written about that. It, not just the lens of climate justice, but the lens of climate innovation at the community level and how we can share messages. But I agree with you. I think there's a huge silo around the environmental field that looks at these massive technological changes when you, you walk across the street and there are people who, who literally can't breathe because they, the air is so hot. So we, we, we don't have a people-centered approach to climate and health intersection. And we look to people like you to bring it forward. So I hope you do. One more question? Yeah. Oh, I, I have to choose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw this hand first. Oh, this is so interesting. I'm Renee Fleming, I'm a performer. And I'm a newly minted uh, Goodwill Ambassador for the World Health Organization. Mm. And my idea for them is to utilize artists to mm -hmm. share p specific messages in various countries. And of course, they have so many countries who are members. Um, so I'm wondering, and I'm, I'm especially horrified by this notion that violence against women is so so much higher now, mm -hmm. but that, in fact, teaching boys at a younger age can be very useful. Mm -hmm. Is it a do you think a possibility to identify performers who might yeah. lend their voices in various yeah. countries to these mm -hmm. messages? Like I know in Africa you can't have cancer. Mm -hmm. You can't tell your husband you have cancer in certain countries mm -hmm. and certain initiatives and there's so much stigma everywhere. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there are a lot of experts in the room. I would so welcome, I mean, I'm not the right person mm -hmm. to do this, so I would welcome your ideas about who mm -hmm. we could reach out to through, through who. Yeah, that's cute. Who Didi, through I who? think you should take this. Yes. Because it's about arts. <laughs> yeah, Didi believes in this a lot. Yeah. So um, in our work with adolescent girls, and more broadly with adolescents, because we um, develop partnership with schools in Haiti to really uh, have a bigger impact on, on on the work that we do. So we 
are forced to work with boys as well. So our programming is really extended to, to boys as well. So we use art, um, different form, forms of art to really, uh, and, and we fuse that with leadership training mm -hmm. to tackle issues of violence, um, disaster preparedness, um, mental health. Um, so um, we used to do a 10-day leadership academy, and Joel is here, we do the same in Rwanda as well, a 10-day leadership academy where we bring a group of 40 girls together, and then we bring um, either musicians or artists um, and spend uh, time with us and really be with the, the, the group of, of, uh, of kids, and we develop, you know, we do creative writing, we do drawing, we do dance. Um, so we're going to Rwanda for the Women Deliver um, conference. I'm going to bring um, a mobile exhibit that I had put together from um, our work in Haiti, mostly around um, how disaster affects you know, girls and their families, but also how gender-based violence and mental health so yes, we use really um, arts to, to do that. Because when you work with young people, it needs to be interactive. You cannot be coming in a classroom, you give your lecture and you go. No, it's not gonna work. You give them space to be able to innovate and create together. And in us, we are there to facilitate. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to see you know, um, further what your ideas are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Could reach the largest group of people sure. yeah. in each territory. And you're Renee, right? Is that right? right? Yeah. This is a really magnificent um, opera singer who we love. Yeah. And we sing. um, you know, there are some incredible Annie Lennox, Angelique Cujo. Mm -hmm. There's a number of artists that would be, and I think in particular, Violence Against Women. Mm -hmm. It's in every. It's really, really, really off the charts in every country, including this country right now after COVID, and it would be wonderful to try to bring. Thank you for offering yes. to help us think about who you could use in that way. Super. And on that note, in the spirit of information sharing, I want to thank my panel. I think there's so much more to go and yeah. do together. Yeah. So I leave joyful. I hope you do too for the possibility. Thank you. Thank you all.